Welcome to the No Jet Stress podcast. I'm really pleased to be able to invite and have on the program James Hewitt, who is a human performance scientist, who is an avid cyclist and has some very interesting distinctions about how to improve the human condition. James, welcome to the podcast. It's great to have you uh, with us to share your insights with this audience, particularly as we're looking, or I'm particularly interested in ways that we can use uh, the insights that you might have to help people understand how they can take those insights and use them in the context of being a healthy, well-adjusted business traveler. So thank you for coming on the show. Thanks, Chris. I'm really looking forward to speaking with you today because you know, my aspiration is to be a healthy, well-adjusted business traveler as well. So <laughs> maybe, maybe I can take a dose of my own medicine while we're talking and uh, learn something well, along the way. <laughs> I think we've got lots to talk about. And yes, the, the core excitement is this idea. And I was thinking about it before uh, coming live with you is that, you know, you're a performance scientist and one of the, one of the tenants that I've had within the field of what I do in terms of helping people manage jet lag is understanding that the best solution that they're going to have to help themselves do that is going to be an individual solution. Mm. One that they are a proponent of, that they actually put in place and that they act on. So for me to have someone like you on board today, it's really important because human performance is about the human being and what they're able to bring to bear in their life to make those changes and make those things happen. And as someone who studied it quite specifically, and also I know that you really like travel yourself, it's kind of like, yes, this is someone who's got two sides of, uh, of the coin and can inform us with the science as much as inform us um, with some of the practices um, that he undertakes and the stuff that he ignores and bring it together. So hopefully our listeners, um, I tend to say viewers at this point, <laughs> I don't know why, but maybe I will have some viewers by the end of this, uh, that our listeners and viewers um, can actually chunk this down into what works for them and how to bring it to bear. But before I get carried away and too excited, can you, in your own words, give us a brief history about um, how you got to where you are today and uh, where you're going with the, the kind of work that you're doing? Sure. Yeah, I'm happy to. I mean, I think on the topic of travel, because I know that's very relevant to your podcast, I think my passion for travel started very young. So um, my dad uh, got a job with an American company um, when I was about three and uh, and so actually no no way younger than that sorry when I was about six months old and then we, we moved to the states and lived there for about three years something like that so and came back you know just after when I was three so um, from quite a young age I was exposed to intercontinental travel and and I just loved it I mean this was back in the eighties you know, I'm dating myself now where you know as a little kid you could go in the cockpit you know you were invited up there yeah. and you know we i think i was spoiled from a young age because you know this was back in the day when travel budgets maybe weren't so closely <laughs> scrutinized and so you know i was turning left from quite a young age when i <laughs> when i boarded and you know and it was just it was exciting i just remember i can still remember vividly the first time that i went into a plane cockpit you know whether uh, and uh, once the plane was was cruising they invited me up there as a as a young kid and just looking out kind of at this incredible scene, you know, the blue skies, the clouds beneath us, all of these buttons and all of these different um, uh, dials and screens. And, you know, as a kid, I was fascinated. And to be honest, I continue to be. I've still got kind of amateur passion for, for aviation now. Um, but going alongside that was this interest from a very early, early age in human performance. And I wouldn't have articulated like that, like that for a long time. But even in that early experience of going into a plane cockpit and looking around and seeing these two guys, because it was mostly guys, you know, back in the 80s, um, I, I was just fascinated by the idea that they were able to pilot to control this aircraft, that they knew what every dial and every button in that environment did. And from that point, I started to become fascinated about what human beings were capable of, particularly in quite demanding circumstances. And that led to an interest in space as well. When I was a kid for quite a long time, I wanted to be an astronaut, actually. And we lived in the States, as I mentioned, you know, in the uh, kind of early to mid 80s. 
and the, uh, there was still a lot of interest in space and NASA and the shuttle launches at that time. And I remember sitting at home with my parents and with my mom, particularly when my dad was at work and watching shuttle launches and just being fascinated again by what humans were capable of in these really demanding environments. So there's always been that, that interest there in both travel and human performance. And eventually um, that started to be expressed personally through my interest in sport. And I, I figured out quite early, I wasn't very good at team sports, but I found my niche in some very obscure sports. And it was always about things with wheels for me. And so quite early on, uh, I found this sport called inline speed skating, um, uh, a very obscure sport, but I ended up being quite good at that. I represented Great Britain for several years and, and won quite a few medals as a junior. That transitioned into road cycling, uh, and a bit of track cycling as well. And I was fortunate enough to, to ride and race full time for several years, kind of into the uh, uh, into the, uh, the mid 2000s. But along that journey, one of the things I realised was that I actually enjoyed the training, probably if I'm honest, more than the competition. And I wasn't the most talented athlete, but I was a very early adopter of technologies trying to understand what approaches were working best for me. And it was a very strange time in the sport back then because to be honest, you know, um, performance enhancing drug use had been rife in that sport uh, for many years. And as a consequence of that, it had held up the development of uh, training science. There were still some scientists doing some good work, but that wasn't necessarily being translated into what people did on their bike. And partly that was because for many years, too many people, not everyone, but too many people basically were able to rely on these performance enhancing substances mm -hmm. to elicit the adaptations that they were looking for, rather than training and trying to get the most out of their own genetic potential. And I decided not to go down that path. So very early on, I was trying to understand what was working best for me and started really informally coaching. I wouldn't have called it coaching at that time. It was just people who observed what I was doing, were curious about it, wondered about how they could apply it to their own training and racing. And, and so as a consequence of that, I started to share that knowledge. When I realized I wasn't gonna be a great pro cyclist, I went back to university, I studied sports science, eventually I set up my own coaching business. And it wasn't as simple as that, but that's yeah. the for shortened version. <laughs> um, and most of the people that I worked with were business people. I had a few clients who were professional athletes, mainly cyclists, as I mentioned, some um, very good amateurs who are aspiring to be uh, aspiring to be pros. But the, the bread and butter of my client base were uh, people who had very demanding careers in London, where I was based at the time, who also wanted to be great cyclists. Right. And right. during the time of coaching them, I realized that unless I could account for the load associated with their working life, I couldn't plan their cycling training effectively. And so I began to try to apply tools and frameworks from sports science to understand what I describe as knowledge work, because most of these people thought for a living. They were thinkers, architects, management consultants, finance professionals, etc. And this sparked this a curiosity, trying to understand this very difficult to quantify world. It's a slight tangent, but one of the nice things about cycling is that we can determine your maximum output. It's quite easy to quantify with something called a VOT max test, for example. But the maximum output of a knowledge worker is incredibly difficult to quantify. Right. But that challenge intrigued me. And in the end, I started to try and conceptualize knowledge work as a cognitive endurance activity in a similar way that you might think about cycling as a physical endurance activity. And eventually I ended up biasing and focusing the vast majority of my work on knowledge work. Eventually I went back to university and uh, I'm actually just completing my PhD at the moment, looking at specifically what I describe as always on knowledge work. So the difficulties that we have with long working hours, struggling to switch off our resources being depleted and how that influences our wellbeing and performance and what we can do about it. Yeah. So really today, that's the focus of my work and research. It's all about knowledge work as a cognitive endurance activity. I've been fortunate enough to be able to continue to travel all over the world, uh, to share some of those insights, to work with clients, to gather data. And um, there's really a mixture of things that I do. I describe it as consultancy, communication, and then also the original research. And um, But continue to have this fascination with what human beings are capable of. Still absolutely love travel and flying. And, uh, but unfortunately, rarely get to see in the cockpit these days thanks to all the, <laughs> the regulations that we've got yeah that, that is definitely um a bummer 
Um, but there's a lot, a hell of a lot to unpack in just that little insight and snippet that you've given us there. One of the things that you mentioned quite specifically there was obviously your move away from the the um, abuse of steroids and things of that nature. So into the sort of like legal things that people can do. Um, it, with your permission, I'd like to actually start there as a basis of a conversation as to what would you think would be the kind of takeaways that anyone who's a traveler should seriously consider that are legal in order to help themselves be a a better well-adjusted uh, traveler as we've said so what can you take you just want to get straight into the good stuff don't you chris <laughs> <laughs> i couldn't resist it i just couldn't resist yeah. it and i'm it's... sure you probably get that a lot but i just couldn't resist it because you are the man to talk to about this in my yeah, opinion well, we might, I think my view on kind of, you know, substances and supplementation and, and these kind of approaches um, is heavily uh, conditioned by a lecturer that I had very early on at, in my undergraduate degree. He's a guy called Professor Ron Morn. He's really a legend in, um, uh, in performance nutrition, you can describe it as. Okay. And uh, I remember after one of my early lectures uh, that I had as an undergrad, he rarely uh, did lectures for undergrads. I don't think he really liked them to be honest. Um, but um, he did a lecture all about um, kind of nutrition. There were some aspects of supplementation. And I remember I went up to him afterwards because I was always really curious about legal supplementation as a cyclist. And so I said to him, you know, what, what do you think about this? And what do you think about that? And he just turned to me and I wish I could imitate his, his accent, but um, he kind of said in quite a gruff tone, um, it, essentially words to the effect that um, if it really works, it's banned. And, um, and, and so, it's an interesting it's an interesting one but there's a lot of truth in that statement because if you really unpack the evidence around a lot of, kind of supplementation approaches um if it really is effective um particularly the things that we're talking about in the context of knowledge work and uh, and travel like maintaining alertness for very long periods for example and um, overcoming some of the um, uh, decreases in attention and vigilance uh, that are associated with fatigue then really the most effective things are illegal, like amphetamines, for example. You, know, you want to talk about um, uh, kind of uh, uh, you know, aviation again. Now, it's not allowed in many air forces around the world, um, but in some, they are still allowed to take certain uh, varieties, essentially, of amphetamine um, in uh, certain combat uh, contexts to keep right. people awake, essentially. Um, and it, it does work, but the downsides are enormous. However, there are a few things that have got a really good evidence base behind them um, that I would recommend. And the first one is, is boring as anything. It's a good old caffeine. But <laughs> caffeine is super interesting in many ways. And um, it's, highly it's highly researched. It's ubiquitous, but it's surprisingly effective at improving cognitive performance. And um, there is a bit of debate about this, even caffeine. And I'll talk about that debate in a moment um, in terms of caffeine and cognitive performance. But... Uh, I wanted just to mention again to try and make this point that um, if it's banned, if it's, if it really works, it's probably banned. But also to dispel some of the myths around some of these substances, which maybe exist in the grey areas. So I'm aware that quite a few people do use some stimulants like modafinil, for example, which is sometimes called provigil, um, as a way to potentially try and enhance cognitive performance, maintain alertness, combat fatigue. Um, clinically, it's used mainly in the treatment of narcolepsy, um, but actually in surveys, it's used really highly. A lot of people use it as a so-called smart drug. Often students use it for studying, for example, uh, and obviously that's strongly contraindicated. People really shouldn't be doing that. But nonetheless, they did a really interesting study where they compared the cognitive performance enhancing effects of modafinil ready, uh, relative to caffeine. Now, you'd think that, you know, because it comes in a little box in kind of, you know, it's, it's capsules, it's pharmaceutical, it must be better. But actually, the study indicated that caffeine and modafinil weren't any more effective than each other. Yeah. Actually, caffeine did as good a job. But the nuance is this. If you look a lot at a lot of the studies on caffeine and cognitive performance enhancement, few of them have measured what's called the recent sleep history of the participants. So they've not measured in the days or weeks leading into the study how much they've been sleeping or not and what their sleep debt is. Some have, but it's, it's rare. So there's kind of a bit of an open question. Not everyone would agree with this, but there is an open question in my view and among quite a few sleep researchers that 
we don't know exactly whether this cognitive performance enhancing effect that we're seeing with caffeine is necessarily truly enhancing above your normal or is actually maybe just restoring cognitive performance to a level equivalent to maybe what it would have been if you didn't have that sleep debt Interesting. so if that makes sense so yeah. there's other contexts where it, it genuinely is performance enhancing i believe so the effects on athletic performance are very clear for example in terms of potentially increasing time to exhaustion um, so how long it take how long how hard and how long you can go for um, and there's other effects which are you know very well uh, very well described but that cognitive performance enhancing effect is is a bit open to debate now that really doesn't make that much difference in the context of business travel in some ways because the vast majority of business travelers will be carrying some level of sleep debt and some level of fatigue and we know very clearly that in that case it does seem to either restore or perhaps even enhance cognitive performance again things like attention reaction time fundamental cognitive abilities which then support these higher order cognitive abilities like being able to focus and resist distraction in a meeting for example um, and also what's described as cognitive processing speed which you can measure of, as speed of accuracy of response which also is quite a good predictor of general mental ability um, and subsequently job performance but when we use caffeine often many of us use more of it than we need to now again there's some nuance in this based on recent sleep history and so this is all just rules of thumb i also really want to point out at this point i'm not a medical doctor this isn't medical advice and um, i'm not recommending that anyone follow any of these protocols or take caffeine um, if you're curious about any of these dosages you know this is uh, speak to your up an appropriately qualified professional basically what i'm doing is for informational purposes translating what the research says sure. i just wanted to get that disclaimer in there for everybody um, uh, but basically the the research that i'm familiar with seems to indicate that um, we often use more caffeine than we need to to benefit from those cognitive performance enhancing effects and it seems that you can enjoy those benefits with a dose as low as 0.3 milligrams per kilogram of body mass per hour now for me that would actually be a pretty small dose of coffee so quite a weak coffee maybe a filter coffee in a pretty small cup so i'm talking not bigger than an es not much bigger than an espresso size cup an hour and um, me being like about 72 kilos so it's really not a lot so the, the the fundamental message there the take home is caffeine little and often and unfortunately one of the things that people do that ends up impairing their performance a huge amount is that they drink too much coffee too often and then that ends up really disrupting their sleep because caffeine has a very long half-life now the interesting thing about caffeine is that its average half-life that's the time that it takes for the concentration in your bloodstream to reduce by 50 percent is about five hours but the interesting thing is, is that if you actually like a lot of research they'll publish the mean they'll publish the average yeah but it'll probably be normally distributed and so you've got people at either ends and it seems that the caffeine half-life can actually vary between a couple of hours up to nine hours so some people are much faster metabolizers than others yeah. but a really simple starting point for performance enhancement for many people would be to adopt a little and often approach to caffeine stop as early as possible and then um, see how that improves sleep but we won't talk about sleep for now i'll stick to the i'll stick right. to the supplement story right and um, so this this caffeine i've got some other ideas as well i mean Please. i'm aware that i've been talking quite a lot but no, 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 i can no, carry on if uh, um, <laughs> well okay if, let me just ask one question about the caffeine then uh, because um, and I, I I don't know if it adds color to what you're describing, but uh, maybe you'll set me straight um, because this idea is that caffeine is a natural antagonist to adenosine. Correct. And therefore, yeah. is it the fact that if we're not necessarily abiding by that measure of 0.3 mil per is it per pound per kilogram of body weight? Per kilogram. That's right. Kilogram yeah, absolutely. Body weight. Therefore, the propensity to my understanding is that you actually start if you over caffeinate you actually get the receptor pulling back further into the cell and therefore you want to add more caffeine to get the same effect and therefore you're almost like you're trying to fight a battle that you're losing by the fact that you're adding more caffeine and becoming more over caffeinated which is causing the cell to respond in a certain way hence people have recommended that it's nice to sort of like perhaps have caffeine for about three weeks and come off for it for like a week or add in decaf there to sort of like give those receptors a time to sort of like come back to the fore of the cell and therefore for it to be more effective would you would you have any thoughts on that 
Yeah, it's a really good question. So that all comes under this umbrella of this idea of tolerance and tolerance to caffeine. And, and so, again, the evidence does indicate that we can build up a tolerance to caffeine. But one of the interesting things is that even if we build up a tolerance to caffeine, it still seems to work. So we still seem to get benefits. Yeah. Um, so if you're just looking for benefits, I, in my view, I don't think the evidence is particularly strong to suggest that kind of coming off caffeine and then coming back on is going to give you an extra benefit when you right. come on, right. potentially. However, anecdotally, and I think with some evidence, quite a lot of us have experienced that. I certainly have, where there's been times where I've kind of come off caffeine and then, you know, have that one double espresso. I feel like my brain kind of wakes up again. Um, so so there's, there might be something there. I mean, I, my view is it's healthy to adopt rhythms in life that ensure that we're not too dependent on anything. And, and so I think that it makes sense to me that maybe taking a break from caffeine occasionally might be good, even if it was just behaviorally and psychologically, to remind yourself that you don't need this thing. And as much as there's some kind of a, um, uh, effect at the level of the receptors in our brain, but you are correct in, in, in saying that essentially what caffeine is doing and um, the shape, the molecular structure of caffeine is very similar to this molecule called adenosine. And during the day, concentrations of adenosine increase. You can imagine it like a sand timer filling up. And, and that's responsible for this increase in sleep pressure that we feel. But what caffeine does is block those receptor sites. So the adenosine doesn't connect up and give us that sense of sleepiness, that increasing sleep pressure. Um, so, um, uh, but in terms of whether we should avoid it, I mean, to be honest, like I drink it all the time and I've had periods of time where I've not for you know months. Um, but at the moment, I'm in a block of time where I've got loads to do and I just like it as, you know, I like to get up and have my, have my coffee. But for me, finding a decaf coffee that I like was a real game changer. And, uh, you know, one of the, there's various different decaffeination methods, but um, uh, one of my favorites is um, CO2 filtration, carbon dioxide, um, and then also the Swiss water method which yeah. are um, you know, minimally, uh, there's very few uh, chemicals involved in that process. So, uh, and it still gets rid of a lot of the caffeine. But I think it probably is not a bad thing to take a break. And also, again, recognizing that effect in terms of uh, um, the half-life and the fact it can vary between people. There's a lot of people that I've worked with who are convinced that caffeine doesn't affect them, but they've just got used to that impairment in sleep. And actually when they've dialed back caffeine, um, and even eliminated it, they've noticed significant benefits to their to their sleep, particularly how long it takes them to get to sleep. Um, so I think it's worth doing that experiment and cycling off, and then see how you feel, and uh, um, um, and then maybe it's something that you'll you'll continue to do. Yeah, great, great, great advice. Um, and then when I think of the uh, business travel in particular, they're normally always over caffeinated, and before we got a hand a handle on the the more exotic or more up-to-date tools that people can look at to manage uh, jet lag and traveler well-being. I think the um, the default mode was, okay, what can I take as a pill? And in fact, this, this is like a segue to my story about Cephalon. Cephalon was a pharmaceutical company who in 2010 wrote to the FDA, if I remember correctly, to try and get ProVigil uh, put... Um, uh, uh, um, agreed to as a cure for jet lag on the basis of help people stay alert. And all they did was fly people on a private jet to France and then prove that they had the capacity to stay awake. And my argument back then was, well, jet lag's not just about attention. So you cannot, protect. anyway, they it got refused, but that was my understanding of ProVigil. So to hear the story come round now and for it to be no better than caffeine is quite interesting and probably... Uh, a good call on the on the FDA side for not actually um, um, allowing it to be the poster child for jet lag when it's only as effective as caffeine. So that mm. was that was that was interesting. Very interesting. I wasn't familiar with that story, but that's that's fascinating. Yeah. I yeah. would have liked to have been a participant in that study, though. I wouldn't have minded <laughs> my jet flight to France. I, I wouldn't have minded. <laughs> sure, there might have been some bias. It's like, so if we say this works, can we go again? <laughs> or it doesn't work can we try it again no yeah exactly <laughs> um but please do continue so caffeine was 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 one of those um items yeah 
The other one is an interesting one because um, I'd say it's probably creatine. So I take very few supplements. Um, so um, I, I wouldn't class caffeine as a supplement. Um, you know, I, I lived in France for about seven years until a couple of years ago, and it's basically a food group uh, in France. Um, but um, so, so but I do use caffeine. And I, the only, uh, I only use a couple of other supplements, but one of those is creatine. And um, creatine is often thought about in an athletic context for good reason. It's, but it's actually one of the most well-researched and effective supplements. There's over 500 peer-reviewed publications looking at various aspects of, of creatine supplementation. And there's really strong evidence that it's associated with various aspects of improved performance in both athletic populations as well as you know, less well-trained people. Um, but there's some re really interesting emerging evidence that indicates that creatine might be relevant for cognitive performance too. And particularly in the context of business travel, where you might be sleep deprived. Now, again, you know, this is emerging. I wouldn't say there's been enough studies to say this definitively. Um, but in terms of the cognitive performance aspects, we can see that creating supplementation for several days can reduce mental fatigue. Um, when that's tested in certain ways, in this, uh, people doing mathematical uh, challenges, for example, in, in, in one study. Um, there was another study that it showed um, it was associated with improvements in working memory, uh, intelligence, cognitive processing speed, again, that, uh, that measure that I mentioned earlier. But then there was one specifically that looked at creatine supplementation for seven days after people experienced sleep deprivation. And what they found uh, was that the creatine supplementation was associated with reduced decreases in cognitive performance in uh, choice reaction time balance and mood state yeah so again it's weird wording it's clunky wording but this is how studies end up getting worded because again similarly to the caffeine as i said there's a difference between kind of um reducing the decrease so making a, a down a, a downside less worse than like this genuine enhancement right so essentially right. what what they were showing was that um creatine improved cognitive performance in response to sleep deprivation so when you're sleep deprived we expected to you expect to see these decreases in things like choice reaction time so that's a cognitive test that measures something called inhibitory control. So technically that's our ability to resist preponent responses, but essentially it provides a building block to help us to stay focused and resist distraction is one way to think about it. Balance is obviously really important. That's actually being able to balance physically and then mood state, positive mood, which we know is associated with lots of other positive outcomes as well, and even supports cognitive performance in its own right. So when you're sleep deprived, you see decreases in all those factors. And when people supplemented with creatine, those decreases weren't as big. Um, now, the dose in that was a bit higher than maybe I would take daily, um, but nonetheless, um, it's those doses, the research would indicate that it's still well tolerated. So I take creatine pretty much every day um, and uh, for the benefits physically, because it's a very high energy molecule and uh, it is naturally occurring, it's synthesized in the body, you can get it from food sources, um, but the evidence in my view, it's pretty clear that it's safe, it's well tolerated, simple creatine monohydrate. And um, in my view, there's good evidence that that's associated with these cognitive and physical benefits and some of them potentially very relevant to business travelers as well. So caffeine and creatine, those two C's would be would be very high up on my list in terms of legal supplementation for performance enhancement. And so at this point, I would also point out um, that I, I follow James here on uh, LinkedIn, and he has some very interesting and very useful um, charts uh, and data sets uh, for people who are interested in things like this. There was one that you published uh, recently that pretty much gave you an overview of how different types of supplements are ranked according to what the scientific literature says. Do you care to speak more to that? Do you know the one I'm talking about? Yeah, I think I can remember that was that was a while ago. But um, but yeah, the, uh, that I think that was actually published by I shared one uh, that was published by Asker. You can drop, I think, my sports science. Um, and so Asker has got a yeah, if you follow me on LinkedIn, that'd be great. You should also check out Asker's um, website, which I think is just called mysportscience.com. Yeah. And you will be able to find the chart that I'll describe in a moment. Um, but again, um, Asker's approach is very similar to mine in the sense that if you look at this chart, which basically shows on two axes, the um, effectiveness, the efficacy and effectiveness, which are actually slightly, they're kind of two different things. So efficacy describes that like, if all the conditions are perfect, um, what, what effects you'd expect to see. 
and effectiveness is more about how that's expressed in the real world but but anyway nonetheless essentially we'll call it efficacy effectiveness on one axis and uh, the the weight of evidence the strength of evidence on the other and you see that in terms of you know the top right corner where you've got the strongest evidence and the best the biggest effect there's not a lot going on there um, uh, you know there's a lot of stuff hanging around that doesn't have a, a huge amount of evidence but i definitely encourage people to to check that out and what you will find is that things like caffeine for example and creatine they are right up there and um, you know i think the challenge is again the efficacy effectiveness questions quite relevant when we're talking about supplements for performance enhancement because there's a if you look at the data in a study there are studies which will show an effect for various different um, supplements and compounds but it's really important that when you're reading that study that you look for example at the population that it was measured in and how long it was measured for the other conditions potential confounders so factors that might have influenced it the size of the effect and particularly on the size of the effect, you kind of ask yourself the question, is it really meaningful? You know, is it is it actually going to be something that, that matters in the real world? Because sometimes, you know, we can get obsessed with with the details, so obsessed with the details that we forget the big picture. And you might look at something and actually, you know, it will say there's a statistically significant effect. But if you actually look at the effect size and what that means in practice, it's kind of a microscopic improvement in the um uh the kind of the value the outcome that they're measuring and there's not really any way for us to figure out is that going to make a difference to you when you're hopping on the plane to boston from london or whatever yeah. um so you've got to ask those questions and again when people are touting these supplements people will claim for example this is supported by academic evidence doesn't that might be true but it doesn't mean it's relevant to you or me um, and there's a, quite a few examples of this at the moment. I mean, one uh, is magnesium, for example. And so um, a lot of people are now promoting magnesium as a way to improve sleep. But the interesting thing is, is that if you actually look at the evidence that describes the potential for magnesium to improve sleep, and a lot of this relates specifically to um, uh, improving sleep maintenance. So for people who are struggling by waking up in the night, the effect only seems to emerge if that magnesium is correcting a deficiency. So, Whereas it's actually being promoted a lot of the time as something that if you take it, it will actually improve sleep just because of what it is. It's got this inherent sleep improving quality rather than it being about correcting the underlying deficiency. And actually the problem with that is, you know, if someone does have an issue like uh, an issue with sleep maintenance, for example, staying asleep, um, there might be something else that they need to get corrected. You know, if it might not be magnesium deficiency at all. It might be something completely different. And so we've got to be cautious about these things. And, and again, when people are recommending supplements, all too often, unfortunately, you find out that there's some commercial affiliation associated with the supplements that they're recommending. And now it doesn't necessarily mean that the information that they're giving is bad or wrong or, or incorrect, but it does create a level of conflict of interest. And I think the reality is that unfortunately not that many supplements work really well and as i said the ones which are really punchy About. probably need a prescription for them at the best at best and at worst right. completely illegal so um yeah I, i'm a i'm a bit of a skeptic and i know not everyone would agree with that position but but you know that's, the only thing i would say to that position on magnesium is that um my understanding is that up to 65 percent of populations and in fact, the spe uh, specific reference I'm um, referencing is from the US. Up to 65% of populations in the US are magnesium deficient. So potentially you could find some benefit, but mm. you know we have idiosyncrasies. Not everybody will be magnesium deficient. So how can you therefore take that and and you know extrapolate it across and blanket and say that it, it, it would work like that for everyone so i think there are those things there but I, I take your point that yeah it's not it's just not supported by the science unless there is a deficiency yeah that's that's my understanding that's my reading of it anyway and um uh but yeah but as you say that's a great stat chris and it sounds like 65 percent, according to that may well benefit which is yeah. you know maybe perhaps one of the reasons why it's so popular but again if we want to kind of be be detailed and kind of uh, rigorous about it it's correcting a deficiency rather than it being kind of uh, this supranormal effect. And we see this a lot with supplementation, actually. And I think one of the other issues that we see with supplementation is that people can confuse kind of acute and chronic effects. Mm -hmm. And you see this a lot um, concerning uh, nutrition 
pr approaches to nutrition and particular foods and cognitive performance, for example. So what you'll see is that there'll be a headline that will say something like, um, eating a teaspoonful of nuts can improve cognitive performance by 10 to 15%. And that was actually a headline in a you know uh, newspaper in the UK a while ago. But the, the data, the actual study that supported that claim um, didn't actually support it. <laughs> and what, what they found was that um, people who were eating that amount of nuts over their lifetime seemed to decline less um, than the people who were eating fewer than that amount of nuts. Um, over their lifetime. Now, don't get me started on nutritional epidemiology, kind of nutritional studies, because <laughs> it's so messy and so much of the data is so bad. Um, but again, you'll find out, you'll find people say, oh, you know, eat blueberries, it will boost your cognitive performance. And people are thinking, oh, well, if I eat these blueberries, then you know, suddenly I'm going to feel sharper in the afternoon, when actually the evidence supporting that is more about over the long term, it preventing cognitive decline. Right. or slowing cognitive decline rather um or supporting cognitive performance over extended periods rather than it being this like instant boost that you're going to get from from eating the thing and that also is relevant to these supplements often where yeah. again if it's correcting a deficiency um uh, there's some examples of where it might kick in really quick but often it is about these kind of long-term supportive approaches rather than things that are going to create this this kind of instant boost which is unfortunately where mindset is a pill mm -hmm. for every ill we want something that does it right now and that's not how you look after longevity or health long term because yeah it's just, it just doesn't work that way unfortunately mm -hmm. totally okay. agree okay so so caffeine creatine anything else you want to add to the list or is there is yeah. anything else that's supported in your opinion before we go to a, a specific key well let's see how how we progress because there's something specific you probably know what it's going to be about anyway and um we'll see we'll see how it turns out anything else you'd like to add to the list on the positive side yeah i mean there's there's probably a couple actually i mean i think you know one the, the one other supplement that i take um uh, if, i don't even really call it a supplement is protein whey protein in my case and you know we we know that we're all at risk of muscle loss unfortunately so yeah, exactly. So that progressive and generalized loss of uh, skeletal muscle mass, strength and function uh, as we get older. Um, and after the age of 30, there's some evidence that we can lose muscle mass at about three to 5% per decade. So quite a lot. Um, after 50, that can increase to one to 2% a year. And so we've got to really proactively try to build uh, and maintain muscle. Uh, because if we don't, we can end up with, you know, the muscle mass of a child and the skeleton of an adult when we get older. Now, the interesting thing, this is relevant to travelers, people who travel, is they did a study a few years ago that found that just one night of total sleep deprivation. So, for example, if you end up having to unfortunately turn left and do a long haul, floor, uh, long -haul flight through the night, very likely you will really struggle to sleep. Um, then, uh, sorry, if you turn right, if you, you know, in economy, you're kind of sitting up straight, you just can't lay back and you're probably going to be awake for quite a long time. Just one night of total sleep deprivation reduced muscle protein synthesis by 18%, increased cortisol levels, that's a stress hormone, by 21%, and decreased testosterone um, uh, in men by 24%. Yeah. Essentially, all those things are creating this super catabolic environment, um, which is going to negatively affect our ability to grow and, and hang on to our muscle. And so I think protein is important for anybody but perhaps even more important for, for travelers um, to try and maintain muscle and metabolic health. Now, the evidence indicates that uh, an intake of 1.6 to 1.8 grams of protein per kilogram of body mass per day, divided evenly across meals, should maximize muscle protein synthesis. So 1.6 to 1.8 grams of protein per, per kilogram of body mass per day. And there's some good evidence in my view. This is a systematic review and meta-analysis. There were 28 studies in it, which show the higher protein intakes equivalent to greater than 1.5 grams per kilogram uh, of body mass per day don't influence kidney function in healthy adults. Right. You know, the evidence really doesn't support, in my view, uh, this kind of risk uh, in a healthy adult who doesn't have a kidney problem, uh, what would be classed as a higher dose of protein. Right. And it's notable because those doses are higher, that I, that I suggested are higher than RDA. Uh, the RDA. And um, so one of the substance I take often is whey protein because it's such an efficient way to get um, a really uh, high quality bioavailable, so easily absorbable and usable by your body form of protein. And you can travel with it because you know what it's like. You kind of get to the lounge in the 
airport and if you're lucky there's a bit of yogurt but most of the time it's like not great there's a ton of pastries you got a load of carbs there where is the protein a bit of dried out cured meat if you're lucky you know uh, maybe a bit of smoked salmon that seemed better days i'm obviously <laughs> traveling in the wrong lounges we could talk about my favorite lounges actually because there's some great ones out there uh, okay. but uh, um I don't want to name any names about the hard ones. I feel bad because I know there's a lot of people working hard in those environments. But but yeah, I've seen some terrible sites. <laughs> On the protein question, this is an aside. So there's, um, there's I, I, I'm interested in your thoughts. There is, um, is it, what's it, an idea that we need to start looking at our muscles as an endocrine gland. Have you mm -hmm. heard of this? Yeah, as a yeah, as an endocrine organ. So as an endocrine um, something organ, that's actually, yeah. Therefore, it plays into the hormonal system in uh, in 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 some way, and therefore is an adjunct to decent longevity, or can add to the longevity conversation. It seems like what you're pointing to here potentially can fit into that type of thinking. What do you? What mm. do you think? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I'm really convinced of the evidence that um, your muscle mass and strength is a very strong indicator of not just longevity, how long you live for, um, but also your health span, how long you live healthily for. Yeah. And, uh, and actually, it seems that if we're able to build then protect that muscle as much as possible. It's associated with much better outcomes later in life. And there's lots of different reasons for this. You know, some of it is very practical. It's very mechanical. If we've got more functional muscle, if we trip and fall, for example, we're more likely to be able to stop that. Um, also, you know, it protects us from injury um, just because our joints are going to work better if um, they've got appropriate amount of functional muscle around them. You, know, you see it, unfortunately, as people get older with that sarcopenia, that loss of the muscle mass, the muscle strength and the muscle function. You know, this rounding of posture as your muscles just stop working as they should. And so there's a very functional aspect to muscle. There's also that hormonal and metabolic aspect, which you which you mentioned. Um, in one of the um, characteristics of muscle that lends itself to that is it's kind of a bucket for sugar. And so sugar in uh, is actually stored in the muscle as a molecule called glycogen. So it's, a, um, uh, it, it's built up, the glucose is built up into these glycogen molecules. And so um, that's really useful because um, it provides an energy source for movement uh, of those muscles. Um, but also it, rep it it's a sink. So if we've got more muscle, we can actually store more glucose. And that's what we want. We want it out of our bloodstream. We don't want it flying around there where once it's done its job, uh, really we want it. Um, we don't want it float it too much of it floating around anyway. And so it present it's it's that bucket and, and there's a number of reasons why it could be associated. Uh, that's associated with better metabolic health um, in the long run. Um, and then also there is this interaction with our hormones as well. So the bottom line is, is that building and maintaining a healthy amount of functional muscle is a really good thing. I mean, the good news is, is that studies indicate we can even build muscle into our 90s. They did one study in a group of um, uh, elderly people who are in care homes and demonstrated that with a, um, a prescribed training program, so it was supervised, uh, these, uh, these older people were actually even able to build muscle and strength in their 90s. Um, so it's never too late to start and there are a ton of benefits. And again, you know, for a business traveler, um, it can be tough. I'd say one aspect of that is nutrition. So making sure you get adequate protein when you're on the road. Um, and then it's about how can you find ways to, con uh, to consistently integrate resistance training into your travel schedule. So for me, that's about, um, I, often, I, I often choose my hotels based on the kind of gym they've got, if I've got a choice. I don't always have a choice. Sometimes the client just sticks me in a hotel. Um, but if I have a choice, I go on TripAdvisor. I don't look at the um, hotels pictures of the gym. I go and look at the guest pictures and see what might actually be there. Yeah, and yeah. there's some remarkably good uh, hotel gyms as well as some terrible ones. It's an aside, but you know my favorite is where there's a pull-up bar that's about, you know, six inches from the ceiling. So every time you kind of get to there, your head hits the ceiling. You know, there's all kinds of crazy stuff, isn't there? But, um, but yeah, thinking about that and then have a body weight routine, um, yeah. which you can do. So um, you get to the point often where if you're training with the right technique and over time, you'll need some more resistance. But actually just to keep you going, there's a remarkable, uh, remarkable amount that you can do just with your body weight. And there's all kinds of guides you'll find online to do that.
and um, just find a way to be stimulating, maintaining, even building muscle, even if um, you don't necessarily have access to the same facilities all the time because you're traveling a lot. Yeah, well said. And and the, the real takeaway there is the idea that um, it's particularly important for people who are deprived of at least one night's sleep. And that is like eight hours. So if you can even get apps now that show you your accumulated sleep debt and it can get mm. more than that. So therefore, you know, taking it seriously and really putting that into reckoning is is quite an important step and a beautiful, beautiful gift to, to, to our listeners. OK, so what's one more uh <laughs> yeah one more um so all right this is the left field one uh, it's a bit of a cheat but it would be light oh okay it's so underestimated the performance enhancing potential of light so the evidence is really clear that there is a dose response relationship between light intensity and alertness and we often don't think about that and so many of us spend a huge amount of our time in a very dull environment and sometimes that drop in alertness that we experience, it's about a number of factors. It might be circadian phase. There are these natural kind of dips in alertness through the day, but sometimes it's because we haven't had this stimulating effect of bright light. And so often, you know, when again, we might turn to the caffeine or some kind of stimulant, you can get a surprisingly powerful benefit just by getting enough bright light. That might be getting outside, for example. Um, even on a cloudy day, the light intensity is, is orders of magnitude higher outside than it is generally inside um, so if you do need that kind of performance enhancing boost get some bright light at the right time and obviously we can talk about light in relation to circadian rhythm and jet lag etc um, but um, that would be my kind of evidence-based performance enhancing tip that is entirely legal and free which is always good yeah love that one really love that one and um, unbeknown to you because we've had this back and forth about time shifter mm. i actually reached out to mickey and i'm oh great the podcast and he's telling me stuff about circadian rhythms that feeds into this light stuff that is just like so Excellent. really really coming to the fore so I'm, I'm really glad that that's one that you've highlight, highlighted oh pun intended <laughs> good one <laughs> um <laughs> highlighted um, but that's great. That's some really good takeaways. Caffeine, creatine, um, whey protein and light. And we've only just started on supplementation. Yeah. <laughs> so um, sit tight, everyone. This is um, me interviewing James Hewitt, the uh, human performance um, person, not person, human performance scientist, um, who's an avid traveler and uh, is looking for ways to help us all do our best Um and that includes business travelers. So the next type of question I have for you is, I, in, 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 so as a trained nutritional therapist, a naturopathically trained nutritional therapist, I look for health metrics that have meaning. And the reason I look for health metrics that have meaning is because if I'm sitting uh, in front of a client who maybe is part of an organization and they're thinking, how can, make, how can they make this cost effective for them? Um, before the results come into being, they want some hard data to measure. And therefore I'm looking at what type of metrics can I talk to them about that will give them the understanding of this is a progression besides the KPIs and targets they might have for within the business or the knowledge work that they're doing, that they can see that the person is achieving and be on an understanding that this is a, this is a progression and therefore a positive. So I looked mm -hmm. at things like, heart rate variability, um, uh, resting heart rate, the quality of their REM to non-REM sleep. Can you, are there, as a, as a human performance scientist, are there some specifics that you would count on or discount or you think are more valuable than other or would you would shepherd people towards looking at rather than others? Yeah, so, I mean, I think on the, the sleep piece is really important and I think, but I'd probably present it with a few caveats. And the main caveat is the fact that as much as I love sleep tracking and I find it quite helpful myself and wearables are actually a big part of what I do in my work and also my academic research, I happen to be wearing an aura ring, an Apple watch and a whoop band at the moment. And occasionally we'll have a first beat bodyguard <laughs> sensor as well. Um, but, um, but so I think it can be helpful, but the evidence does indicate, and I think our own experience shows us that um, people do have differing response to sleep tracking and quantification. So while I think that having a sense of sleep duration can be helpful, 
and it's not helpful for everyone and actually sleep tracking for some people can actually increase anxiety and can actually work against what they're trying to achieve which is to maintain or, or improve um, adequate quality sleep and you know, when we're talking about adequate sleep we're talking about seven to nine hours which seems to be you know, the consensus of the amount that you need um, for healthy functioning of, of both our mind our brain and our body and um, so but I do find it helpful to get a sense of how much people are sleeping. And, and, and I do think wearables can be a helpful way to do that. The accuracy of wearable devices does vary quite considerably. And that would be my second caveat. So the first is, is sleep duration a helpful metric to be tracking for someone? Is there a possibility it might make them more anxious? And um, if that's not the case, if they're happy to track it, it could be helpful, they're interested and, and curious. Then my next caveat or question is, is this device tracking sleep duration accurately enough? And so I'd be looking for devices that I'm confident are um, accurate enough for what's called two-stage sleep classification, which means that they can monitor whether you're asleep or awake. And actually, most devices, many devices now are doing that pretty well. So, for example, Aura Ring and, um, has got very good two-stage sleep classification. So has Whoop, um, which are um, accurate enough relative to a gold standard measure. And the gold standard that they use is something called polysonography generally. So uh, poly because they put multiple sensors on you um, to very accurately measure not only when you're asleep or awake, but also various aspects of sleep, like sleep stages. And that's where you end up with um, greater than two stage sleep classification. So you can get into looking at um, time spent in different sleep stages, for example. That would probably be my second caveat, actually. My third caveat, sorry, would be um, I don't actually pay that much attention to how much time I or other people spend in sleep stages. And the reason being that um, the, the validation data for most wearable devices suggests that there's a huge amount of variability in how representative those um, measures of different sleep stages are, the time spent in sleep stages. Some are getting better. So Aura has recently released a new algorithm, um, which uh, they developed with a guy called Marco Altini. Um, and he is like the guy to follow if you want to find out about heart rate variability, for example. Um, but he helped them to develop the algorithm. He's a super fascinating guy. And um, he's got a, um, if I'm remembering this correctly, I think he's got a master's in computer science and exercise science. Um, and uh, um, he's uh, he's got incredible depth of knowledge in data science as well, and uh, developed an app called HRV for training and HRV for biofeedback. And anyway, the interesting thing is, is um, talking about sleep stage accuracy. So the algorithm previously that Aura used, something was going on with it, which meant that um, for people with very low resting heart rates, it seemed to do a very poor job of um, representing time spent in different sleep stages. And I started to pick this up where I've got a very low resting heart rate. So you're talking like 34 during sleep. Um, some of that's genetic, some of that's from many years of endurance training. And um, I always had these really weird sleep stage results from Aura, like super low time spent in REM sleep. I'm, talk I'm saying like, you know, 20 minutes and that kind of thing. And I was like, I just don't think this could be correct. And then I um, happened to post my resting heart rate in re response to someone else on some social media platform. And a couple of people got in touch with me uh, subsequently and said, oh, you know, I've got a really low resting heart rate as well. And we got talking and it turned out that they'd experienced the same phenomenon where the sleep staging algorithm didn't seem to work very well for them. Anyway, to cut a long story short, um, uh, when the algorithm was updated with uh, by Aura, suddenly I started to see way more time in REM sleep, for example. So something happened in how they waited um, that uh, that resting heart rate. But this relates to a broader point, which is for most of these wearable devices, the algorithms that they use to compute time in sleep stages aren't public. We don't know how they do it. And most of them haven't been validated. And when they have been validated, there's quite there's a huge amount of error often. Um, and so it may be representative for some people, but not others. And we just don't know. And because of that uncertainty, I tend to look at sleep duration. And the second thing that I look at is sleep consistency. So um, providing that the device can measure um, awake and sleep time pretty well, which most of them can, and also determine sleep onset and the point that you wake up, um, then you can figure out sleep consistency. So um, the variation in the time that you go to bed and wake up. And that seems to be really important for several reasons. One, because if, you're, if you've got a lot of variation in your sleep consistency, the time you go to sleep and the time you wake up, essentially you're inducing jet lag. It's called social jet lag, um, which then has a whole load of other knock-on effects. 
And so ideally we want sleep to be as consistent as possible. And if you kind of as a, um, as a coach or a therapist or whoever is trying to help someone to improve their sleep as an outcome measure, if their sleep duration is improving, so they're regularly getting between seven to nine hours and their sleep consistency is improving. So you're getting that variation um, in sleep and wake time down to between like 20 and 30 minutes then um, I would suggest that you know, what you're doing is, is probably nudging people in the right direction. And I don't really worry too much about sleep stages because, again, providing there isn't a serious underlying issue, um, if you can get people's sleep duration and sleep consistency in a good place, then often the, the sleep stages, the time and sleep stages, the depth will, will follow, providing there's not kind of other intervening factors. There's another interesting thing I'll just mention about sleep consistency. So um, I, I do measure sleep as part of my academic research and as part of my practical work as well. And I look at sleep quite a lot. I'm not a um, specialist sleep researcher. I lean on other people for, for that um, super specific expert insight. And you know, there's a number of people um, uh, that you, you, I know you and I both follow, uh, Chris, you know, Dr. Els van der Helm is one. There's a guy called uh, Dr. Michael Gradasar is another um, uh, you know, great researchers um, in sleep who also do some very practical work. But there's one guy who's really absent on social media called Professor Stephen Lockley um, at Harvard. And he's he was really responsible for getting me interested in sleep and teaching me huge amounts about it. And actually, incidentally, Professor Lockley um, was uh, one of the main contributors to developing the algorithm that um, powers Time Shifter and uh, because his expertise is sleep and circadian rhythm. And so we had a very interesting conversation and this is really kind of quite speculative, but he has this hypothesis and, and that uh, he said he'll say himself that you know, other researchers are looking into this more closely. But there is a possibility that sleep consistency may be even more important than sleep duration, providing that, you know, you're hitting seven to nine hours of sleep. Now, it's an interesting one. So the hypoth one hypothesis, and this is completely unproven, but this is just an idea that he was floating around and that, you know, uh, um, we uh, um, uh, that I, I kind of entertained. Uh, I hope he doesn't mind me sharing this. Uh, but one idea that we entertained was what if, for example, um, seven hours of consistent sleep, so going to bed and waking up at the same time every night for seven hours was better than like eight and a half of inconsistent sleep. Um, now, he wasn't saying that's the case, but he was saying that's something that needs to be examined and some researchers are starting to explore this. But whatever the case, one thing is very clear, sleep consistency is really important. Now, how annoying is that for business travellers? I mean... <laughs> I yeah, yeah because it's 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 tough isn't it I mean I know that um uh you know my uh when I'm I'm in a block at the moment where I'm not traveling so much because I'm working on some other projects uh finalizing some projects and so which makes it easy it's easier for I'm at home uh, I'm at home to do that and but you know prior to the pandemic I was doing about 100 flights a year and you know you look at my sleep consistency it was terrible and not just in terms of I didn't, you didn't need a major time zone change, even if I was flying just in Europe with an hour or two hours, maybe just because of the flight times. So I think a practical thing to do is to accept that you're not going to be able to perfect sleep consistency, but be a bit more intentional about when you take flights. But also you know, sometimes one of the things that I often did is, you know, I would sometimes stay an extra night or arrive a night early to take a flight that meant there was less disruption to my sleep and wake time. And again, there's a cost implication to that, but if you are able to influence the budget allocation, I would suggest that there's gonna be a return on that investment, not just in terms of cognitive performance, which obviously could have a dollar value uh, attributed to it because you'll be performing better, um, but also potentially um, in terms of your health as well because of that reduced disruption by better sleep consistency. So metrics, sleep duration, sleep consistency, and then HRV definitely, but again, I've got, quite a lot of thoughts on HRV, but I'll, uh, I'll pause and uh, uh, hear your reflections on that before, maybe before we delve that into That sounds HRV. very interesting. And, and from the little uh, that I've spoken to Mickey about, he was really hot on that sleep consistency aspect. And in fact, it was so funny in, in uh, he, he offered me his calendar link and his sort of like his, his slots are from like the afternoon towards the evening because he knows that he's a night owl and therefore he's, set up his life to work like that. Unfortunately, it's business travelers, you don't have that luxury, which then leads me on to a follow-up question with, so what are the mitigating things that one can do? I've actually heard, I, I'm not, I don't think I necessarily believe it to be totally true or in the sense that it was meant, but some people try to uh, 
discount the idea of sleep debt, saying you can't really claw back sleep debt. Well, I think I understand where that's coming from. But at the same time, I think I understand that it's an idea more than anything, because if you're trying to be consistent and you've got sleep debt, then how do you claw it back if you're trying to sleep the same amount of hours? If that was, you know, going forward forever the same, then you're you're in a bind, if you see what I mean. Or am I, am I making sense? Um, the, yeah. Yeah. I, think, I mean, one of the things that's driving that message that you can't kind of recover sleep debt um, is it's a counter to the mistaken belief that we can treat our sleep kind of like a credit card um, in the sense that, you know, we can, um, if we don't sleep enough in the week, for example, there's this idea that, false idea, if you, um, uh, you can kind of accumulate debt during the week, so you sleep in four hours, for example, and so maybe you sleep four hours a night for three nights and say so your optimum is seven. So there's nine hours of sleep debt accumulated because there's three nights where you get three fewer hours than you needed. So you've got nine hours of sleep debt to, to kind of pay back. So then on Saturday, Sunday and Monday, instead of sleeping seven hours, you sleep 10 hours and then your sleep debt's cancelled out. It doesn't work like that, unfortunately. So um, uh, it's the, uh, it doesn't work like a credit card. Um, and I think what they're, what they're saying is you know, there's going to be a knock-on effect from that. And often then you end up in with this continuous disruption because the sleep extension um is then resulting in a decrease in sleep consistency as we just and talked quality, about and is. quality and then all kinds of effects associated with that so i think that's the message there really that i'd encourage people to take away um from this idea that um you know, sleep debt can't be recovered i mean that said there is evidence around sleep extension and even um you know in tactical context so most of the time that refers to military context there's some really interesting research on the effects of um uh, kind of a, a prophylactic so sleep extension prior to um uh, bouts of sleep deprivation and perhaps whether that can have some kind of protective effect um and you know people can go and search out some of that that evidence but i think that it's it starts to get a little bit risky when we're kind of suggesting um uh, these approaches which are you know likely to be associated with some negative health outcomes even if it might maintain performance i mean an example of this is polyphasic sleep exactly so that got popularized by you know quite a lot of uh, people in silicon valley and probably some of the best examples of polyphasic sleep in practice come from around the world sailing and so solo sailing specifically because if you are going around the world on your own um you cannot afford to stay asleep for very long because you're not vigilant bad things happen um, and uh, and so they uh, the sailors adopt these polyphasic patterns and the evidence does indicate that um, you can actually maintain surprisingly high levels of performance for, for long periods um, but there are costs associated with that and so you know, one of the things I often say you know, to people who are in very demanding jobs and who are traveling a lot for example um, and this is where it can almost becomes a bit more philosophical really you need to ask yourself the question, is it really worth it? Um, because I think that we're being disingenuous to suggest that there isn't a cost associated with some of the lifestyles that we lead. Um, you know, there are lots of travel, circadian disruption, suboptimal food, not being able to exercise. You've got to make sure it's worth it because there is a cost. And you know, for me, uh, I've kind of I've have ad ad adjusted some of how I approach. I don't travel as much as I did. And um, several reasons for that is some of it is about health. Some of it's also about relationships, you know, time with my family um, and my friends as well. But um, but yeah, I think, you know, I, when people go too far down the route of, you know, what tactics can I use to maintain performance you know, in a super demanding, um, uh, very disruptive environment, um, then often I do encourage people to say, you know, there's probably some things you could do, but just because you could do them, should you do them? And if you do them, make sure that you're clear about the costs and benefits and that you're okay with that cost. Um, because that's a question that sometimes we don't ask, particularly if we're living at hundred miles an hour um, yeah. or even faster at 30,000 feet um, <laughs> and going from one fun thing to another. And, you know, I did it, I mean, a, a few years ago and I had this crazy, I, I remember in my itinerary, I called it the four continent trip. So I was doing a series of speaking engagements on four different continents. Some of the continents I was going to them twice. And I was just going from place to place to place. And I absolutely loved it. 
people said to me, oh, James, how do you cope with it? It was so much fun. I was all over the place. I was on the West Coast. I was on the East Coast. I was in India. Um, you know, I, it was it was great. I met all kinds of different people, some fantastic speaking events, um, great travel with really good airlines, which always helps. Um, but there was a cost. I mean, I got home and I crashed hard. Um, and um, But I knew that would happen. So in the lead up to it, I made sure that I was really fit physically. I'd slept really well and consistently going into it. My, my batteries were full because I knew that it was going to it was going to kind of wear me down. And I think that's the key really, it's about recognizing those rhythms. And I think that's one of the challenges for business travel travelers is we don't, and I've got a whole model and framework around that, but it Can looks like that resonated with that? me. Because I think I've heard you speak about that before, where it's this idea that you know, because what, what I would do <clears throat> with a client is, I, I tried to pass this sleep depth thing, like, okay, you normally sleep X amount of hours, you've got a project on, so you're gonna stay up an extra hour. How can we add power naps or, you know, just shut eye or, you know, non-sleep deep rest bouts into your itinerary that can give you a little extra boost in order to make up those hours you're taking out of your sleep over an extended period of time. That's how I would normally pass it. But you specifically had this, you talked about this idea of knowing something's coming, ramping up beforehand, so you're kind of like full to the gills before going into that. So by the time you come out, you're not totally depleted. Did I get that right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and it comes from this principle, this athletic training principle called periodization. And and so um, if you've, anyone's done any training, physical training, they might be familiar with this. But basically, it's the idea that you would break a training block down into different phases. And in different phases, you likely emphasize different aspects of your physical development. And, but also, these phases would have different characteristics in the lead up to a competition. And so you'd have build phases. But then very importantly, towards the end of the training block leading up to your peak, your competition, you'd have what's called a taper. And so the idea is, is that through this training, this periodized training program, you, know, you might have a period of time where you're really focused on building your endurance, your aerobic base, lots of low intensity stuff. Then you might have a period of time where you're focused more on these high intensity bursts, for example, even though you're doing a bit of everything. And during these periods, there's overload and there's recovery and there's overload and there's recovery. But then at the end, often what you end up doing is maybe for a week or two weeks, it depends on the individual, um, you maintain training frequency. So you train as much but you cut the volume in half. And so you keep intensity, but you do 50% as much. And by reducing that training load, then it means that your, again, your batteries are full. And when you go into that competition, you're fresh. So essentially this is all about balancing that relationship between stress and recovery, which really is at the heart of sustainable high performance. And I think that applies very well to knowledge work um, and to particularly to business travelers in very demanding contexts. So, Ideally, what you want to do is to, if you can, look at your year and see whether you can identify periods that are definitely going to be characterized by overload and some which are intense overload. And so for me, for example, when I looked at that, that four continent trip, and um, that for me was like a race. It was like a stage race in cycling, multiple days back to back. I knew I was going to be broken down by that in some ways, even though I really loved it. It was my kind of competition period. So I was very intentional leading up to that, as I mentioned, to make sure that I was sleeping really well, I was physically fit. And then in the week into it, I deliberately massively reduced the volume of the work that I did. Now that required quite a lot of preparation. I was doing tons of presentations and keynotes and workshops while I was away. And often what you find is that you know, people end up um, doing all that preparation at the last minute. But because I'd started to think about this months before, it meant that I could afford in that final week to finish a bit earlier spend a bit more time with my family, get some really good sleep, make sure I went to the gym regularly uh, or rode my bike um, so that um, I was in a really, I was minimally disrupted and refreshed going into it. And that was my taper. And so we often think about the recovery piece at the end of a very demanding period or in between. We rarely think about the preparation. And I actually think that, that preparatory taper going into a demanding block can be really helpful. Now I recognize that's not possible in every context, Sometimes there's unpredictable things in certain business environments, but many of us probably could take a step back and be a bit more intentional and proactive about recognizing those periods of intensity, but also when we can recover proactively before something that's really going to take it out of us.
Yeah, lovely. I like I like that word, preparatory taper. Preparatory taper. Mm. Add that into the lexicon for sure. Okay, so <laughs> um, this is this is great. This is really great. So can I can we condense? I mean, and actually to summarize the the metrics on sleep that you mentioned was sleep duration, consistency, and HRV. Yeah, yeah. So look yeah, at HRV during yeah. sleep, and yeah. okay. again, I say uh, so. Yeah. Um, uh, just on on the HRV piece, HRV is most informative when you figure out your baseline and you see deviations from it. But really, good HRV, in my view, based on the evidence, is not necessarily high HRV. It's stable HRV. So um, you will see these days where suddenly there's this big spike in HRV. And you can be like, ah, oh, this is a day that, you know, if you use a wearable that uses HRV as part of some kind of readiness score, it'd be like, you are ready. Sometimes that's true. Sometimes that can actually be a response to maybe an underlying infection or something bad. And um, so really what you want is kind of relatively high and stable. And you'll figure that out over time. What relatively high for you or high, uh, will mean they're the times where life is consistent, you're well rested. What's your HRV after two weeks of vacation, providing that you've not been drinking too much, um, uh, for example. And then aim for that um, and use, I think nocturnal HRV is a good one. I think actually using something like the HRV for training app where you just check in for a couple of minutes e each morning, uh, That's their, that method uses the phone's camera, but it's been validated against um, uh, ECG. It's a very accurate measure just by placing your finger on the phone's camera it uses PPG essentially. Um, and if you do that, you'll get this baseline and then you can start to see what things are causing deviations, but also is it trending up over time? HRV obviously does go in and inform these readiness scores and things like that. But the problem is with these readiness scores and um, that again, the algorithms are not public. So often they're weighted heavily, a lot of a lot of the time they're driven by HRV, but I prefer to just look at the underlying HRV value, to be honest. And average HRV during the night is pretty good. Potentially those brief measures in the morning are even better because all kinds of things happen during the night um, which can influence it. Um, but um, but yeah, that's uh, that's how I would look at HRV uh, and uh, as, a, as a metric that helps me understand that balance between stress and recovery. If it's nice and relatively high and stable, then that would indicate there's this good balance between stress and recovery. If you start to see these drops or strange things happening, probably a signal that maybe there's something quite out of, uh, there's something out of balance in that relationship. Cool. Cool. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. I've just, uh, I want to move on to sort of like skill sets in human performance that you think are particularly valuable and crossover for, for business travelers uh, and, uh, and road warriors. But before I do, there was actually a question I forgot to ask, which was, about melatonin what mm. are your thoughts on melatonin yeah so i mean there's a there's a quite a few different views at the moment aren't there so you know there's some people who would say that we're only just starting to understand the wide-ranging effects of melatonin and actually we started to recognize it's quite a bit more powerful than we thought i.e it affects a lot more systems than we thought because technically mel melatonin is a hormone even though you can buy it off the counter in a lot of places like the us for example um it seems that if you use small amounts at the right time, then it can be helpful with um, adjusting to jet lag uh, or adjusting to new time zones, because essentially it's a very powerful cue to your body clock. And you'll find actually that in the Time Shifter app, you can select the option to travel with melatonin and it will give you indications of um, uh, when to take melatonin. A lot of people make the mistake and think that melatonin is a sleep aid. Um, but technically it's it's not um, it's actually providing a signal to your circadian rhythm to your body clock um, which can help you to adapt to that new time zone because usually that is going to emerge naturally because of that natural circadian rhythm and also related to it getting darker um, because obviously light actually suppresses that uh, that uh, secretion of melatonin um, and so you're kind of overriding what's going on and providing this big signal to try and get you into that new time zone you know, I've been on planes and I'm sure you've seen it where the person sits down next to you and you know, pulls out their melatonin pot and pops it and they're like popping them like candy. That is not the way to do it. So I would really recommend, especially like if you're in the UK, for example, where you can't buy melatonin over the counter and um, you know, speak to a medical professional about it because it would need to be prescribed. Even if you're in somewhere where you can buy it over the counter, that's, that's perhaps even more risky. Reason being is they've done some studies recently 
looking at the um, melatonin content relative to what's on the packet um, with many over-the-counter uh, melatonin preparations, so like pills or in the States, these kind of gummy sweets are quite popular. Um, and they have found massive variation, ranging from some which have got a way lower dose than it indicates to some that have got a way higher dose. So I'm cautious about melatonin. My, my reading of the evidence is that it can be effective in terms of speeding up adaptation to new time zones. When I travel across multiple time zones, so like more than three hours generally, um, more, uh, more than three hours difference, I might use melatonin. Um, I often use the time shifter app to, to, to suggest when, when I take it or I'll, I'll get professional advice to do that. And it's a preparation that I'm very confident that it has exactly in it what it says it's got in it. Um, that's another thing to be mindful of with melatonin as well is um, it's pharmacokinetics. So um, how that is, uh, how that substance is absorbed in the body and over what time. There are studies that show that, but there's not a lot of studies that show that what happened when you mix melatonin in some kind of dissolvable pill that's flavoured with blueberry. And, and maybe it has the same pharmacokinetics uh, mm -hmm. characteristics, or maybe not. So approach with caution, I think is my, uh, uh, my advice and get the appropriate professional advice uh, yeah. if you're going to try and use it. But my experience has been with that appropriate professional advice and um, uh, uh, a quality of melatonin I can be confident in. I found it actually very helpful for getting over jet lag more quickly. Great, uh, great to note. Um, my, my position has been that it's basically a hormone and it's going into uh, a body that has a biofeedback in terms, system in terms of how hormones work together. So potentially you are risking upsetting that balance um, because it's an open loop, as it were. And therefore, um, my tendency is to offer people 5-HTP, which is one of the sub, what do they call it a substrate? One of the precursors before you get to the body making, I think it's two steps away from, one or two steps away from mm. making melatonin. Therefore, hand over the intelligence of how much you might need to the body as, as a, as a, um, a solution as to rather than taking something that, as you say, uh, there's a wide variety of different evidence suggesting that it's not it's not always what it says is on the label. So yeah, uh, well, uh, interesting think, topic, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely, definitely. Okay, so if we talk about skill sets now uh, for human performance, are there? Are there things that you found that you think everyone should be looking at? And I mean, going back into knowledge work, I think you, as you obviously have said already, you take aspects of, um, you know, the sports science and bring that into the workplace. Are there some of those things that are very useful uh, to business travelers or you think they could be, they could do better understanding, uh, understanding them and applying them for, for better outcomes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's some things that I'd classify probably as frameworks, and there's other things that I would describe as skill sets specifically. I mean, I think there's lot, several examples of frameworks that apply equally well from an athletic context to a business context. And one of those is that periodization approach that I described. So this idea of breaking our year down into different phases and recognizing periods of effort and recovery. Um, but also I think that applies not just over longer periods, but also daily. So recognizing these variations over the course of the average working day. And so it seems that most of it's experienced a variation of maybe 20% in our cognitive performance during the average day, which is often characterized by this peak valley and then a rebound. And depending on whether you're a more extreme early bird or a night owl, that determines kind of how you experience those phases and even potentially in what order. So, you know, an extreme um, late type, so an owl, and um, rather than having a peak trough and then this rebound might actually start the day with a trough, have the rebound in the middle and then the peak at the end of the day. Okay. Um, but most of us have this peak trough, this peak valley and, and rebound. And so a principle I think many people would benefit from would be to uh, start to think about how they can synchronize different types of work with those phases and try and match the type of work that they do with um, the characteristics of those phases. So for example, the peak, is a really good time for that focused, concentrated work because you're much more likely to be able to resist distraction and interruption and you'll likely be very alert. And so being intentional about blocking time for that focused work to coincide with your peak 
Then in the valley, recognizing that you're going to have this natural dip in the day. And so schedule some of that recovery time during that period, which could be going for a walk, for example, getting outside in that bright light, as we talked about, maybe having a caffeinated or decaffeinated drink, depending on, on the time of day. And during that break time, I generally suggest that the break should have several characteristics. Ideally, you want it to be active. So there's some level of movement and um, there should be a relaxing component. You want a decrease in cognitive and physical load. Um, and then also there should be a, ideally some kind of social component. Actually interacting with people about non-work topics seems to help unless you're a really extreme introvert who can't think of anything worse than having a chat with another human being. Um, and then finally, a natural component. Actually seeing natural scenes, leaves on trees, clouds in the sky is associated with something called attention restoration. And there seems to be this uniquely restorative benefit of seeing natural scenes. And so try and make those breaks active, social, relaxing with some kind of natural component. Um, and then in the rebound period, one of the interesting characteristics of that is uh, it seems that our inhibitory control, our ability to resist distraction is a bit reduced during that time. We're more likely to be switching. So that's often quite a good time to do all those menial tasks, the switching work um, that sometimes ends up polluting the whole day. So instead right. of letting it pollute, just try and block it into that, that rebound period and then have some kind of wind down at the end of the day. So the underlying principle there is about you know, either be on or off rather than in this middle gear all the time. And I talk about the peak as high cognitive gear, you're really on in focus work. The valley as a middle gear where you're kind of, uh, sorry, the valley is a low gear where you're really recovering. And then the rebound is this kind of middle cognitive gear where you're doing this kind of menial tasks and the switching work. So it's periodization, there's cognitive gears. And then I think in terms of mental skills specifically, uh, we often underestimate the power of self-talk both in an, uh, an athletic context, but also beyond. So self-talk refers to the words that we use. It's our inner monologue. And in an athletic context, they've demonstrated that it is incredibly powerful. So for example, they did a study where they looked at the effect of um, the words people used in their monologue to themselves when they started to experience discomfort associated with a, a 10 kilometer time trial effort. So that's a, a typical test used in sports science, ride 10 kilometers, as fast as you possibly can. And what they found was that when people used words like, I can manage my energy until the end, when they started to experience that discomfort and had thoughts like, this is really hard, I'm going to run out of gas, then using those words like, I can manage my energy to the end actually improved their time trial performance by 15 to 71 seconds. Now, that doesn't sound like a huge amount, maybe, but to put it in context, um, there was a time trial of a similar distance in the Tour de France a few years ago, and 15 seconds would have taken the winner to the third step of the podium. 17 seconds would have taken them to 131st position. Mm -hmm. So um, it's profound. Now, in a business context, there's also studies that indicate what that might look like. And some of the best examples are actually relate to public speaking. So there was a study done on the effect of instead of telling people to calm down, when they were nervous about an upcoming public speaking engagement, teaching them to reappraise. So that means reframe or look at in a new way, that feeling that they were experiencing as excitement rather than anxiety, that encouraging people to reappraise, so reframe that experience as excitement, improve their performance as well as reduce their stress. And uh, that improved performance was measured by other people and people rated their communication as much more effective, much more convincing. There's also studies that, um, uh, that are related to that that show that shifting our stress mindset, so actually our beliefs about stress, uh, can have an influence not only on our performance, but also on uh, physiological measures, like our cortisol response, uh, our, our cortisol reactivity, for example. So um, uh, reframing again, so considering that stress could be enhancing, so recognizing that you know, stress is uncomfortable initially, but then reappraising it, reframing it is something that could be enhancing and energizing, not only improve performance, also reduce people's negative physiological response to stress. Mm -hmm. So I think in terms of mental skills uh, that business people, business travelers uh, could, could, could adopt, that kind of reappraisal, cognitive reappraisal uh, and looking at self-talk is absolutely critical. And if you think about it, for example, what happens when you uh, arrive after a long flight you're feeling fatigued, you may be a bit nervous, pay attention to that in the monologue and reframe it. There's also some evidence that that 
has an influence even in terms of how we've perceived our sleep. So um, there was a great study done, uh, or several studies actually, that um, uh, looked at deception. And so basically what happens if you trick people about how much sleep or how much um, how much time in different sleep stages that they've had. And you're talking about sleep stages again, they did one study where um, they gave some people some brief education to tell them that they needed to get a certain amount of time in REM sleep. Um, uh, and if they didn't get that much, uh, then their cognitive performance would be worse. And they fed back the time in sleep stages on a wearable device that had a screen that, that showed them that information. But the interesting thing was, is um, they uh, they also set up this measurement device in the lab, but it was a sham. Actually, they weren't measuring sleep stages at all. All the feedback was false. And what they found was, was that relative to control conditions, when people were told that they got more of this particular sleep stage than they actually got, um, they performed better. When they were told that they got less, they performed worse. That's also been demonstrated to be true when you tell people about sleep duration. You tell people their sleep is longer or better quality, they perform better. You tell them that it was shorter or worse, they perform worse, regardless of what's true. So in terms of those mental skills of self-talk and reappraisal, related to that, I often say to people when they're traveling, if you know your sleep will be disrupted, either don't track your sleep or don't look at the data if you can be disciplined enough. And if you land, you know, after several time zone difference and maybe some jet lag and not as much sleep as you'd like, or you've got to the hotel late and you have to be up the next morning after a short night of sleep, don't look at your sleep. And when you wake up, pay attention to that inner monologue and actually tell yourself that if you're nervous, you're energized. If you're a bit worried, you're excited. Don't look at your sleep. Tell yourself you'll be fine. You've got the resources. You've got what it takes to perform at your best today. And the evidence would indicate you will. Um, and it's certainly going to be a better outcome than if you start worrying about the fact you only slept three hours with X amount of REM and listen to that in a monologue that is telling you to be scared about the day. So, yeah, yeah so that would be that'd be a big one for me is that the mental skill of reappraisal and being aware of your self-talk. Great, great tools. And again, it encapsulates this idea of, you know, performance, human performance science and the fact that it's down to the human and what better way to arm people with uh, skills and frameworks, as you've put it, to, to help them do that. Because the idea is also that <clears throat> sometimes people think of going outside of themselves for a solution, which you can do to certain degree for some things. But ultimately, if you're more if you're empowered by the fact that you have the tools at your fingertips or your ability to, to use them without any outside input it's an even more empowering tool so um i've enjoyed this thoroughly james so i think we're just coming to the closing um um part of our conversation um i could go on forever i really could <laughs> um but time uh, i don't think time permitting uh time permits us to do that i wanted to get your views specifically on something that's come about uh fairly recently i'm not sure if i've actually mentioned him already but are you familiar with Brian Johnson, the $2 million supplement man? Yeah, and his blueprint. And his uh, blueprint. Pathway to living forever. Uh, I, 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 uh, I have uh, an acquaintance who runs a clinic um, in the UK um, that does a lot of biohacking stuff. In fact, I used to be part of a biohacking committee once upon a time. And I've seen all the bits and pieces. And he was asked to comment on that. And he made, uh, uh, he made uh, a statement uh, in his interview that pretty much is true and it's it, brian johnson's echoed it himself on the surface it kind of looks like maybe he could be narcissistic he could be you know he hasn't got anything better to do with his time this that and the other but when you dig into his data into his story he's actually a lovely guy he has um he has a goal that um is bigger than himself and even though he's spent all this money uh, invested in all these tests, supplements, 110 supplements a day. You know, he's, you know, religious with his sleep. Um, he wears a whoop and apparently he's got a 100% score for like four months in a row. I'm like, what? Um, amazing. We can dream. <laughs> in my dreams. Um, but when, so one, uh, he, he basically says, and he's he really is a lovely person, or from what I can tell, it's all about the idea that, yes, there is the blueprint. It's published there for everyone to be able to dip into if they want to. 
but you can actually get a lot of these gains by doing the common sense thing. Some of the things that we've been talking about, sleep, mm. nutrition, and managing your energy. And I find that heartening because I don't have a spare two million pounds lying around to go and invest in and do stuff like that. Um, have you heard of him? What do you think it means in the context of the kind of work that you're doing? Because you're about mm. performance. He's in his, I think, 30s, but he has um, biological markers of an 18 year old, according to the tests that he's done. I think it's fascinating. I'd love to get your take on it. Yeah, I think he's a really interesting guy. And I think it's one of the challenges is he's almost kind of become a caricature of himself and um in in social media and some of that by his own doing i think and some of it by by others as well and unfortunately that then can obscure i think some of the lessons that we can take from it um and so in my view is that i mean if you look at society through millennia there's always these extreme outliers and you know maybe a thousand years ago we would have said that someone like him was a prophet the thing about prophets is some of them were bonkers and a lot of the time they were wrong and uh but occasionally they were right and maybe or a bit of it was right and so i don't want to be quoted on that that i think that brian johnson is a prophet please don't quote me on that because i don't think he is but i'm just kind of setting the scene in terms of if we look at it kind of through the span of human history you get these extreme people and sometimes we disc we can um, discount everything they say because we don't resonate with the way it's delivered and then miss out on something good that might be there. And I think that Brian Johnson's maybe an example of that, because I think there are some things that we can learn because he is pushing the extremes. And when you do that, you can sometimes get a signal that there's something that's worth exploring in more detail. I think one of the things that I found quite interesting as well about his approach is that um, he is happy to admit from what I've seen that he's wrong. So uh, an example of that Healthy. specifically was um, he started to use human growth hormone um, because he believes that there might be um, a rejuvenation effect with some of his organs, for example, but actually found that um, the, the negative side effects associated with that, um, particularly in terms of what he was able to measure in terms of biomarkers, um, suggested to him that actually um, it wasn't a healthy thing to do. Um, uh, overall, it was going to have a net negative effect, even though he felt that there were some positives in some areas. So he actually stopped that. Now, some clinicians, rightly so, have said, well, we could have told you that. That's why we don't prescribe growth hormone for anti-aging. Mm -hmm. um, but but actually, you know, when you've got, if you think about, there's some other very famous, well-known um, people who are very interested in longevity, particularly in the tech space. And I won't name any names, but if you do a Google search, you'll find it. Um, if you Google kind of, you know, billionaire growth hormone, it will pop up. And there's several um, uh, you know, tech billionaires who um, were quite open about the fact that they used growth hormone in their um, regimen as, a, as an anti-aging approach. Um, you'll find many anti-aging doctors in the United States in particular who'd be very happy to prescribe people growth hormone. But because none of them were taking this super rigorous approach to measuring their biomarkers, they didn't find out that actually it was probably a net negative. Um, and actually someone like Brian Johnson, because he's taking this whole battery of tests and uh, he uh, he brought that to light and some people would say he didn't need to we already know um, but actually in terms of the the kind of the huge microphone he's got um, maybe that's helpful for some people so so I think you've kind of got to take everything that he says with a pinch of salt and um, I certainly don't agree with a lot of what he says but I think that some things that he says and does that there's something we can learn from um, and actually you know i do kind of see him more as a personality than anything else he's kind of like almost like you look at a professional wrestler do you know what i mean you, oh, like, you know that okay. it's okay. kind of like it's extreme it's a bit of a show yeah. and he doesn't take himself that seriously you know he likes to bait people in social media but i just encourage people to to keep an open mind um, however that said i can't remember where this quote is from but I like it. It says, um, there's this quote and it says, um, be careful that your mind isn't so open that your brain falls out. <laughs> and, you know, and I think that's also true because we want to be open-minded with people like Brian Johnson, but not too open-minded. Right. We also want to make sure we're critical uh, in an appropriate way and, and try to uh, distill uh, in terms of all the things that he's doing, you know, where the truth or where the good might be because I do think there's some some good in there. So uh, yeah, that's my uh, kind of uh, my view on on Brian Johnson, and I think he's a fascinating character. Um, nice uh, but I know he's very polarizing. Yes, indeed, indeed. Just had to ask that one, and then uh, I was going to ask: Do you think there's a role for technology 
in um <laughs> in human performance and travel but you know whether it's the aura ring the apple <laughs> watch the whoop and sometimes if i think that's a definite yes and i think that's mm -hmm. uh, that's really um a non-starter um what i'm interested in is where it could go from here do you have any thoughts on where tech might go yeah what's next i mean what i actually think that um the next frontier is going to be about finding ways to integrate some of these technologies and approaches structurally. So that's where I see like the IoT of travel. things. Not necessarily even that. So an example that I'll give you is: so say I get a jet lag plan, right, from my um, uh, from from time shifter. I'm constantly having to create this bubble around myself because the environment that I'm in is not set up in any way to accommodate that jet lag plan. And so an example of that would be if you're using blue light blocking glasses or even sunglasses because you need it to be really dark. So many times I've gone into an airport lounge and got on the plane um, wearing sunglasses and a baseball cap, looking like a complete idiot. Um, you know, um, a lot of people think I'm a poser or something because, but we're all on the same plane, going to the same time zone, there's going to be a significant group of people there who would likely benefit from adapting to this new time zone with this type of light exposure um, that this app is recommending. So imagine a scenario where when you got your plane ticket, it also gave you a jet lag plan. And in the environment that as much as the airline was able to accommodate it, there were options to be able to, for example, prioritize bright light. So you've got like blue light or natural light uh, um, mimicking lights in the lounge, for example, or even on the plane, as well as dark areas. Um, also, you know, one of the reasons I really like Qatar Airlines, for example, is that um, you can get your meal whenever you want, which works really well in terms of a jet lag plan. Whereas you know, very often with other airlines, I get on the plane, uh, you know, they come around with the menu straight away and they want to give you the evening meal because it's the evening there. But actually, yeah. what I really want to do is get in my four hours of sleep or whatever, and maybe get some food a bit later, but I end up just not having anything. And um, so, again, if that technology, that technological approach could start to be integrated in the experience, I think it could really amplify and improve the, uh, improve it. So, so I'd say that for me, kind of one of the frontiers is about that integration and application at a more structural level. Uh, certainly in the context of business travel, I think it applies to workplace well-being as well, where, you know, we actually say, how do we take these learnings, these technologies, and um, start to fit the environment to what we know, rather than having to do so much uh, at an individual level, where you know, in the end, we're quite limited uh, in terms of what we can do sometimes. Yeah, totally. Uh, it, you kind of like bring that home for me when you think of you. Know, you're on a. It doesn't matter which class of travel you're in. You go to the toilet, you close the door, and bang! You're just flooded with white yeah. light. You know, like, like you you are going back to bed, but hey, here's the white light, everyone. It's kind of absolutely. Like, yeah, yeah, exactly. Very nicely put. Okay, so uh, rounding off, I'm going to ask you uh, a traditional question for us here, which is, what is your favourite destination and why? Yeah, I think, you know, there's lots of different places that I like. Um, I think one of my favourite, it depends on what I'm going for, I think, but I think one of my favourite cities in the world like, is uh, Singapore. I absolutely love Singapore. Um, one of the reasons being, like, I do actually like, long flights so you've got a decent flight there <laughs> you can kind of enjoy the flight on the way there you know you feel like you're going quite far away yeah and exotic um, too <laughs> yeah and it's such a cool city i just find um i really love the the biophilic design so i really like the way that they integrate nature into okay. the city so you've got super contemporary you could even say futuristic buildings with all of these green features, you know, plants grow, uh, um, kind of woven into it. Um, I think food is great. You can get pretty much any cuisine, but obviously kind of the um, uh, Asian and Asian inspired food there is fantastic. Yeah. Really interesting mix of people. Great for doing business. Nice hub as well for getting to different places. I mean, you're not even that far from Australia once you're in Singapore, really. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there's tons, but uh, I've been there this year. Uh, it's, it's kind of um, a few months ago, so it's kind of front of mind at the moment. But that's definitely one of my, my favorites. And the airport is pretty good, too. I mean, that that it is rated like as one of the best one. airports in the world. Yeah. And, you know, with that um, uh, the huge water feature, uh, yeah. you know, the jewel in the middle, um, you know, it's just absolutely spectacular. So whenever I go there, kind of a bit excited you know it's <laughs> such a fun place and obviously you know we've got the grand prix coming up soon which is a you know if you can get there for a grand prix weekend unfortunately i won't be there this year for that but um you know the city really kind of comes alive yeah. in a different way even yeah. though it makes getting around an absolute nightmare because of all the barriers <laughs> but it's still it's something to experience if you get the chance it's a great pick um i even heard it said that locals go 
to the airport for mm. you know Sunday on you know like Sunday lunch because yeah. Yeah, it's kind of like that place. And then and we used to stay at the Fairmont, which gave you on certain floors a view of parts of the of the Grand Prix track. Which yeah, was exactly. So people used to love to do that as well. So, uh, yeah, uh, I love that city. It's yeah, it's it's is it it's a twenty four seven city pretty much, is it not? Pretty much. Yeah yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously, I wouldn't know that because I'm I'm in bed getting my seven to nine hours. So, uh, <laughs> I've, I've honestly never I should... I've I've never been to any really good parties at the top of Marina Bay Sands. Not. <laughs> James, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on board. Where can people find you if they want to dig into the kind of work you do, connect with you, uh, whatever? Please let us know. Thanks, Chris. Well, if you're on LinkedIn, then I post regularly on there, and you know, uh, I'd love to hear your views on some of the comments uh, and with some comments on some of the content that I share there. Um, but also on my website, that's jameshewittperformance.com. You'll find blogs, deeper dives into some of these topics. Um, but um, but yeah, LinkedIn's probably an easy place to get hold of me. And if there's anything you want to talk more about, you've got some questions or ideas you wanted to share, then please feel free to drop me a message there and I'd welcome the opportunity to continue the conversation. Lovely. Thank you so much for coming on to the No Jet Stress podcast. Love to have you back again um, with some more insights uh, in the field of human performance. Uh, and yeah, we wish you, well, you're, closing in the, uh, the the last of your doctorate and what have you. So wishing you success in that and looking forward to to, to welcome you aboard uh, the No Jet Fred podcast again in the future. Thanks a lot, James. It's been really, really, really a pleasure. Thank you. Likewise, Chris. Cheers. Okay. That was phenomenal. We managed to go. I was beginning to get concerned about the time. Thinking... I know, I know. I kept I kept on glancing across at the time because I was like, how long have we been talking for? I totally lost track because I was like, <laughs> it was just an interesting chat, wasn't it? I think like yeah. we've, we've got so many shared interests. It was just fun yeah. to, I hope you don't mind just letting it roll. It was uh, it was good. No, not at all. I think um, my platform is probably going to want to cut it, but it, it, me it means they keep coming back as in we have to do it in more than one, more than yeah. one episode but that's perfect that's brilliant and i think if i'm correct even though i'm going to rip the audio to the podcast i'm also going to sort of like um publish uh, snippets uh, as well great on youtube so it becomes because i haven't done uh, a visual before but I, I think this is appropriate and yeah yeah that'd be great yeah i really appreciate your time today uh, considering what it took to to make this work and I've enjoyed it thoroughly. We must yeah. do this again uh, in the future. Really yeah, it's really fun to chat with you, Chris. And yeah, just look forward to staying connected. I think you know, we, we both share a passion for these topics, don't we? So let's uh, let's definitely stay in touch. All right, then. Thank you so much. And I'll be in touch. You're welcome. Cheers. Have a great day. See you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.